So, Dr. Tom Wingfield, thank you very much for making time for us today and sharing advice and experience for the Arise Hub. So, can you tell me about your background and the involvement in COVID-19 response? Yes, so hello to everybody out there in the Arise Hub and it's really uh, fantastic to be able to speak to you about this important uh, scenario that we're going through with COVID-19. So, my name's Tom. Uh, I'm a doctor, I'm an infectious diseases doctor and I work at the Liverpool School of Tropical Medicine. My interest is specifically in tuberculosis and I work at the Royal Liverpool Hospital. Um, and I've previously worked in other countries, including some in informal settlements in Peru, where I worked with uh, people with tuberculosis, and more latterly in, in Nepal and also Mozambique and Vietnam. Um, so uh, at the minute I'm actually on the COVID-19 ward that we have in the UK and I'm trying to also, uh, along with people like uh, Professor Theobald, try and help people to understand a bit more about COVID-19 and dispel some of the myths. Brilliant, thank you so much. So can you tell us what is COVID-19? So, so what is COVID-19? So, so COVID-19 is a what's called novel, which just means new coronavirus. And uh, coronaviruses, you, you might have heard of other coronaviruses such as SARS, which is the um, uh, severe acute respiratory uh, syndrome, or MERS, which is the Middle East Respiratory Syndrome, which caused some, some uh, previous less widespread outbreaks. And there are about seven types of coronaviruses uh, uh, that can infect humans. But this one specifically was found in about December 2019 and it was thought to originate actually in a seafood market in, in, in Wuhan in Hubei province of China. And um, it was felt that it might have originated from uh, wild animals that were being sell sold there, perhaps bats. It spread through the air, just like any other kind of cough or cold illness or tuberculosis, for example. It can be spread a little bit on surfaces, but, but not as much. And the thing to get across to everybody is the vast majority of people have very mild symptoms from this. Uh, so things like a flu-like illness, cough, some fever, and sometimes shortness of breath. Thank you very much. And other people who are more vulnerable to yeah, so, COVID-19? So other people who are more vulnerable, it's a good question. I'll, I'll break it down into two um, stages. Other people who are more vulnerable to get COVID-19, actually at the minute we don't quite know and I think we'll see that going forward. What we do know is who is more vulnerable from, from COVID-19 to severe disease. And those are people really who generally are older or who have existing illnesses. So things like, uh, for example, chronic lung disease, so asthma or, or COPD, chronic bronchitis, um, or ischemic heart disease, so any heart, chronic heart problems, kidney disease, diabetes, um, if people who have cancer, and also some forms of immunosuppression. So if your immune system is, is low, we know that those people have a higher likelihood of severe disease, but I would still like to stress the majority of those people still will survive to good health. For our partners out there in countries who uh, might have a high prevalence of HIV, we don't actually know yet the impact of HIV and COVID-19. It's likely that if, you're, if you have HIV, if you're on treatment and if your viral load is suppressed, you will actually have no more risks than anybody else in the population. So it would just keep encouraging people to take their HIV medicines if they're on them. So in the Arise Hub, we work with partners, co-researchers, participants, mm. many of whom live and work in informal settlements. And some of these questions have come straight to us from Slum and Shack Dwellers International. Yes. And we're working in collaboration in Kenya, Sierra Leone, Bangladesh and India. So people are asking, what measures should we take in our households and communities to prevent the spread of disease? We do not necessarily have ready access to soap or water. Social distancing is also going to be challenging as our communities have a high population density. So in these contexts, what would you advise in terms of prevention? Yeah. So the, the first advice I give is general generic advice, uh, and that's quite straightforward. It's to do the simple things that you do if you have a cough or cold. So these might include, for example, just regularly washing your hands where that's possible, or avoid touching surfaces, um, avoid contact in terms of other uh, shaking hands with other people. In fact, my colleagues in Nepal are very happy that the namaste greeting has become more popular. Um, 
and uh, avoid touching perhaps surfaces that might be uh, uh, communal surfaces, for example, door handles or, or other surfaces that many people might have touched. Um, th that's common sense. Um, other things are if you do have tissues available for your coughs and colds, then do use them. If you have a bin available, try and bin them. Uh, and we call that catch it, bin it, kill it in, in the UK. But obviously if you don't have those available, which many people won't, it's a good idea if you can just to try and cough or sneeze into the crook of your arm and if possible wash it afterwards but that really avoids the spread of droplets to, to, to other people. Um, so I, I, think, I think those are the general advice uh, for, um, for individuals. In terms of household advice obviously the same kind of rules apply really just try and, try and keep surfaces as clean as possible. We, we know that alcohol based uh, cleaners, uh, sodium hypochlorite or, 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 or um, hydrogen peroxide based cleaners do work in killing the virus. The other things that you could do are um, potentially try and increase the ventilation within your household especially if someone's unwell. If you have doors or windows try and keep them open. We do know actually in it, in informal settlements actually ventilation of households is often quite quite good. I do appreciate that sometimes it may be cold or sometimes there may be security issues but where possible try and do that and if you can open your window your, your curtains or, or let sunlight in the evidence isn't great from the real world but we do know that UV rays and heat in some cases can destroy uh, viruses so I think that's worthwhile to do and I think the other important thing is that if you have somebody in your household who is unwell who has symptoms if it's at all possible, if they could try and uh, either use a different part of the household uh, or, or potentially sleep or eat in a different part of the household. I think it's, it's vital that we let people know that they're, we are not stigmatising them for this. We are supportive of them, but what we're trying to do is just keep each other safe. Um, if you can't isolate someone within the household, perhaps do things a bit differently. If you eat from the same bowl, perhaps think about not eating from the same bowl. Uh, and as I said, if somebody is able to not maybe not use the same cutlery, if you use cutlery, um, maybe not to use those or the same cups just during this period of illness. In terms of social distancing, um, th these, these really, social distancing sounds quite a grand term and it actually sounds quite scary, but, but really it's whilst we have this, um, this pandemic of coronavirus or COVID-19 to try and keep distance. So to, to avoid contact with people, as we said, from the household who are, who are having symptoms of COVID-19, but that also goes for the community as well. There are big movements towards working from home where possible. Now, uh, clearly for some people that's going to be extremely difficult and some people do not have access to, for example, virtual or internet uh, to do that. But if you, do, if you are formally employed, then it's a good idea to talk with your employer about that. The advice is to avoid large and even small gatherings. Um, so in the UK, for example, that's pubs where people gather to, to meet in it, um, cinemas, theatres and restaurants. Um, we know that if you're a working age adult, actually most of your contact is, is in the workplace, but whereas if you're an older adult, say you're towards 60s, it might actually be in the home, at the shops and other things. So I suppose it's to encourage you to think about where your main points of contact might be and adapt some of the advice that's been given. If, for example, a point of contact is your place of worship where people congregate, it might be a good idea to, to consider whether or not you should stay away from that place temporarily or uh, consider other forms of worship. There are, for example, shabins, uh, obviously, or, or drinking houses in, in certain places that would also be advisable to stay, stay away from. The other thing that you could do is if you use public transport is to think if there are other ways that you could get to work. Uh, for example, walking or bike, appreciate that may be difficult in some places, uh, or whether you could vary your hours, so go at times when they're not uh, extremely busy. Appreciate this advice isn't always possible to follow, but I think it's good to at least consider. Um, the final thing is that even with your friends and family, uh, this is hard, and we're all going to find this hard, but we need to try and avoid large gatherings with friends and family if we can, because we, you have the same risks within those gatherings of transmitting illness. Um, so where possible, try and keep in touch through other methods. Um, you know, we're all trying to support each other through this. and the, These measures won't be easy, but I think we're trying to do this for the sake of ourselves and our families, our communities, and, and, and the global community as well. Thank you very much. So how do you treat COVID-19 at home? Are there any low cost measures we can take? Yeah, so how, how do you treat COVID-19 at home? I, I think the first thing to, to say is that the simple measures are 
again the best. The majority of people will have virtually no symptoms or very mild symptoms, fever, cough, shortness of breath. Things you can do are the same things if you're ill with anything else, so keep up your fluids, um, have a balanced diet where you can, rest well, take rest where you can. Um, I think thinking and planning ahead if you're unwell and asking people who can support you to perhaps get you food, for example, and leave uh, and bring food in for you to obviously inform employers and things is, is useful. If you smoke or drink, it'd be advisable to try to stop doing those because they don't help your immune system. Um, in terms of if you have fevers, the usual rules apply really. If you have availability of paracetamol, it's a good idea to try and take it within what's prescribed on the, what's recommended on the box. Um, but if you don't have paracetamol, simple things like cold compresses, towels with, a, with, with cold water are, are, are useful to try and bring your temperature down. And again, opening those windows and trying to let some air in, some air through. That there aren't any direct treatments available uh, for COVID-19 and to be honest with you they're, they're not actually necessary in the vast majority of cases anyway like an antivirus and antiviral medication. In a small group of people um, they may develop bacterial pneumonia and may require antibiotics but that is a tiny group of people. Antibiotics don't work on their own really for COVID-19 so, so it's not advisable to go and get antibiotics from the pharmacy uh, and, unless you seek some advice about that. The vast majority of people, as I said, will not need antibiotics and will get through this with just some rest at home. Those are the simple advice measures I'd, I'd give you. Thank you. And we know there's a lot of misinformation circulating. So what are your recommendations for reliable sources of information on COVID-19? OK, so, so the reliable sources, I think that will depend on, on what country you are living and working in. And I think each country is developing their own guidance and obviously I, I, I can't speak for every country in terms of how reliable that guidance is. I'll tell you the, the, the sources that I know about um, and these are sources from predominantly the UK but also the US but they are, they do have good generic advice that you can use. So the first is uh, from Public Health England and it's actually called Public Health Matters and this is a blog that is intended for the public and I've seen some excellent advice on, on that blog that's written in, 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 in pretty straightforward language um, with key points that you can take away from that and I've, I've included a handout for, for Professor Theobald that I'll send round to people with links to those if, if you can access those. The Lancet and British Medical Journal also do have resource centres that are open access that you can use if you want for healthcare workers specifically and people for example who are, who are working on these projects to get some further evidence uh, um, in kind of bite-sized chunks. I have to say those are more related to, to evidence but they still do have some summaries of, of, of COVID-19 that are very useful. The US CDC, the Communicable Disease Centre advice is also very helpful. In terms of more global uh, uh, advice, um, what I've seen so far is WHO, World Health uh, Organisation, has some, has some really good advice, including an excellent myth busters section, mm -hmm. which really is trying to say what's, what are the facts and what are people worried about naturally, but actually isn't, isn't the case, isn't true, and that's called the myth busting section. And interestingly, the World Economic Forum has some open access pages I think are, are directed more towards the Global South that I think are really useful uh, pages. I think for you generally, I think it would be a, a good idea to keep abreast, to keep updated with uh, the the what's going on in your newspapers, your radio, your television, if, if you have them available. But obviously, to bear in mind that that, that information is changing on a day-to-day -day basis and, and so sometimes it is difficult to filter that information out. Most ministries for health are setting up uh, um, education packages currently for COVID-19 and I hope that that would be the case in, in your community. If you feel that you're somebody who has good knowledge and, and can filter some of this information, obviously you can make your own local guidance, um, perhaps collectively amongst a group of you, of the best available evidence and you could package that in a very simple way for your own communities uh, on a piece of paper for example if possible. That's very good advice and I think it is a time for community solidarity and sharing of information. Yes. So Tom, what should our research teams do to protect themselves and to contribute to the prevention of the spread of illness? Yeah, so I think the first thing to say is all the advice I've given you from 
individual public to household is the same for research groups we are no different there is nobody who is uh, exempt from 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 that guidance we're all in this together and you mentioned solidarity we, we have to be trying to do the same things and i think even more for some of our researchers we and, and research groups and community workers and volunteers we have to try and be role models for other people to say actually those people are following the advice maybe, maybe i should too um, so the advice is no different I appreciate these are times that are stressful for people in terms of people being worried about income. Um, I would say that most research groups, and I imagine it's the same in the Arise uh, network, are contingency planning for uh, what we can do to uh, help each other during this time, especially with ongoing uh, projects. So I think obviously staying, doing all those things that I've advised you before is, is necessary. Talking with, with, between yourselves as groups for what adaptations you might make, but also being aware that actually a lot of the funders of our projects are being very flexible now and are providing um, um, postponement or delay to the end of grant dates so we can put things on hold. Uh, I appreciate though that, that I don't know uh, in all of your countries what mechanism that would mean in terms of you getting paid. I don't know the answer to that question. But I think the main thing to do is follow the advice I've given and to liaise within your own projects about what you might be able to do to adapt uh, to, to, for example, work from home if necessary. Great, thank you very much. And how can we help people maintain good mental health in the face of COVID-19? Yeah, so how, mental health in, in COVID-19 is extremely important. So we all acknowledge that this is a stressful time and there will be worry and fear um, for your own health, for the health of your family, of your community, for the finances of your household. These are normal things to be, to be going through and it's completely understandable. There are certain people in your communities or your households that we are more vulnerable to stress and those include, for example, the, the vulnerable groups such as older people that we've talked about, children and teens, um, people who are unemployed or have substance misuse issues and people who have pre-existing mental health issues. So I think it's important that we look out for those people especially there are other things you might find just to look out for in terms of monitoring yourself for stress, so things like difficulty uh, changing your eating or sleeping patterns, difficulty concentrating, uh, and, and trying really uh, to monitor if you do use alcohol or tobacco, often in times of stress the use of those in, in increases. So it, it's advisable to try and try and not use those things in, uh, uh, as, a kind, as, a, as a crutch really during those times. If you're isolated, it's understandable to feel bored to feel frustrated, to feel angry. These are all normal things. If you can communicate with people um, it, it, virtually if you can, but uh, otherwise perhaps just, just by phone, uh, it's important to let these things out, to talk to each other, to communicate so that we know we're not alone and you're not, you're, you, we're all facing the same thing. Um, I think the things that you can do to support yourself are, while I think it's great to be up to date with the guidance and keep up to date with, with, with all the changing COVID scenario, it's important to give yourself a break because looking at these scenarios hour to hour, day to day actually sometimes creates more stress. So sometimes make sure you have a window of time where you switch off any social media, where you don't look at newspapers. I think that's important. Take care of your body. So. Some people do breathing exercises, some people do meditation. If you can exercise, which is fine, it's outdoors if you can, but I understand in some settlements that might not be possible because of security or other issues. But when, where you can take exercise, take leisure if you can, especially outdoor activities. But I think the key point for me is communicating. Tell people how you feel. A bit of advice for parents. If you're a parent, um, your children's stress and anxiety levels will be will mirror your stress and anxiety levels. Um, so if you can be a role model for your children and try and, uh, I suppose, maintain calm, that will help your children in many ways. It will be up to an individual family how they choose to either tell, uh, to inform their children about what's happening in terms of COVID-19. If, if you do choose to do that, which I do think is a good idea, obviously tell their children in, in their own, in their own, um, in language which they understand um, uh, but I, I think this helps to arm them with the facts themselves and I think as a community 
the spreading of knowledge it really is an empowerment and it is, a, it is able to um, support us to really understand what's going on and I suppose to drive down some of the fear and anxiety levels because to reiterate, I've said it a few times, the vast majority of people will return to full health from this illness. Um, some of you will be parts of civil society organisations, women's cooperatives, um, uh, uh, community groups. You could consider whether you want to adapt those groups temporarily whilst we have this pandemic towards COVID-19. I think that we have a lot of power, intellect and uh, um, energy within our communities to, to be able to support each other through this. Uh, and so if you are a member of those groups, perhaps meet with your, your peers and think about how you could, you could support your community in terms of knowledge uh, sharing, for example. Um, so those are the things that I'd suggest. You know, we are all in this together and whatever country you live in, whatever community you live in, and I think we need to take collective responsibility and lead by example. Thank you so much, Dr. Tom Wingfield. We really appreciate you taking time from your extremely busy schedule at the front line of COVID-19 in the UK to share advice, words of wisdom and experience and solidarity with us in the Arise Hub and in other projects too. So huge thanks to you. Thank Go you. Well. Thanks everyone. Thank you.